Rome, the eternal city and center of the Roman Catholic faith, a universal symbol that unites the world, including members of a fraternal organization founded in the United States, the Knights of Columbus. Since 1920, from Benedict to Benedict, the Knights have stood by the popes and the people of Rome through war and political upheaval, through times of hunger and moments of joy, from building playgrounds for the youth of Rome to building bridges through diplomacy, from restoring precious Vatican art to funding the satellite transmissions of papal events. The Knights of Columbus have stayed true to the vision of their founder, Father Michael McGivney. Today, with 1.8 million members in 13 different countries, the Knights of Columbus is the largest Catholic fraternal organization in the world. Impressive growth for an organization with humble roots. In 19th century America, Catholic immigrants began arriving in droves. They were not always welcomed into American society. One of the perennial questions in the 19th century was concerning whether the immigrants coming to America from Catholic countries could be faithful Catholics and at the same time loyal Americans. Catholics were often ostracized in communities across the United States. Their churches were burned or graffitied. You really are dealing with a, a, a visceral anti-Catholicism. But even without this prejudice and fear from the Protestant majority, the Catholic immigrant population was already in a state of crisis. They're working in the most difficult jobs, the most dangerous jobs. People get tuberculosis, people have industrial accidents, people have heart attacks, they drop dead. So this is long before unions. This is long before workers' compensation. This is long before any kind of safety net exists. Catholics were also barred membership in many mutual benefit societies, meaning husbands and fathers had no means of protecting their family in the event of an untimely death. Many widows found themselves and their children doomed to destitution and ruin. If you could not support your children, the law, the probate court would come in and take your children and farm them out. They would literally take children away. It is exactly this dismal situation that prompted a young priest into action. Venerable servant of God, Father Michael McGivney, was the pastor at St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. He was deeply concerned about the pressures tearing apart Catholic immigrant families. On October 2nd, 1881, he called a meeting of local Catholic men in the basement of his church. He shared with them his vision of a Catholic fraternal group bound by the spiritual principles of charity and unity. Columbus in the 19th century was a hero in America, highly regarded as an explorer, as someone courageous. The Knights of Columbus wanted to build on that image uh, for themselves. Our first Supreme Knight, James Mullen, then suggested the word Knights because he wanted to emphasize the knightly virtues, uh, standing for social justice, defending the poor and the helpless. And Father McGivney's vision spread quickly as Catholic men were drawn to this new fraternal organization. Within 25 years of the founding, we had councils in every single state of the Union and nearly all of the provinces of Canada, and, uh, and had councils as well in Mexico and in the Philippines. And the Knights became chief defenders of Catholics in that time period. So all these newly arrived immigrants saw the Knights as protection protection against prejudice. And that was a very, very powerful lure. But when America declared war on Germany in 1917, Knights of Columbus would be called to protect more than their Catholic brethren. Not only do thousands of Catholics serve courageously in battle, the Knights of Columbus also expanded their charitable work during the war. At the request of President Woodrow Wilson, the Knights created recreation centers for soldiers. These popular places of rest and relaxation came to be known as KC huts. 150 huts were set up across Europe, including at the famous Hotel Minerva in Rome. 
The theme was everybody welcome, everything free. So men could come in and have uh, a smoke with some friends, play cards, write a letter to their families, and have the wholesome kind of camaraderie of their uh, fellows that they were working with at the time. It was important to us to show that our notion of unity transcended political differences, political boundaries. The World War I huts earned the Knights of Columbus respect and admiration from returning veterans and the general public. The Knights were also greatly appreciated in France, where the majority of the huts had been located. In 1920, a delegation of 235 Knights, led by Supreme Knight James Flaherty, traveled to France as guests of honor. The French were extremely grateful for all that the Knights of Columbus had done, and they invited them to visit France. Then, having traveled across the ocean, they said, we're already here, let's go to the Vatican. Pope Benedict saw the impact of the Casey's, of the Knights of Columbus hut movement. A delegation of Knights went over to the Vatican, and the Pope said, this really works, and you were extraordinarily successful. I want you to do some stuff in Rome for me. And on that occasion, the Knights of Columbus asked the Pope, Your Holiness, what can we do for you? And the Pope said, I am here in the Vatican, but do something for my children of Rome. Benedict XV saw the problems politically that were developing in Italy at the time, and he wanted the young people to be under a good Catholic influence. He had great respect for the Knights of Columbus. Benedict XV was aware of what the Knights had done for soldiers during the First World War, which is why he invited them to do this. To begin their charitable work in Italy, the Knights decided to construct playgrounds for the youth of Rome. From that beginning, eventually, five playgrounds would be constructed. These playgrounds were and remain free for everyone. The playground project required working closely with not just the Vatican, but with the city of Rome. Past Supreme Knight, Edward Hearn was dispatched to make sure construction of the new playgrounds ran smoothly. But Hearn spoke no Italian and had limited contacts. A chance meeting with Enrico Galeazzi, a successful Roman architect, would change his fortunes. Galeazzi was hired by Edward Hearn to be the chief designer of the new playgrounds. Between 1923 and 1927, the Knights of Columbus opened five athletic centers in Rome. They were the link. I would say the only one that allowed us to have these playgrounds to exist. Because Rome was not in a position to build playgrounds, both because of the economic conditions and the lack of organization. My memory is that there was a lot of envy at those who had access to the playgrounds during busy periods. Rome did not have many playgrounds, therefore, it was a real privilege to have the playgrounds here. The rise of fascism in Italy presented challenges for the Knights of Columbus in Rome. In 1931, Mussolini nationalized the playgrounds, forcing them to close briefly. However, after several months of negotiations, Enrico Galeazzi successfully negotiated a reopening under Knights of Columbus control. These playgrounds of the Knights of Columbus continued to function during the fascist era, when no organization could function unless they formed part of a fascist youth organization. 
l'organizzazione fascista. Not even the Boy Scouts were Catholic action. Only the Knights of Columbus playgrounds were allowed to function. And even during the Second World War, the playgrounds in Rome remained open. I campi dei cavalieri in Roma restarono aperti. You need to remember that the Americans were the enemy. Yet, they continued peacefully as a uniquely non-fascist organization during a fascist era. It was very important. Despite gaining influence and respect internationally, the Knights of Columbus still struggled against prejudice at home. Knight of Columbus Al Smith faced a resurgent KKK and opposition to his faith during his 1928 presidential campaign. And anti-Catholicism was the principal reason there had been no formal diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican since the time of the Civil War. But Knights of Columbus representative in Rome, Enrico Galeazzi, helped bridge that divide. He was a very close friend of the future Cardinal Spellman. He also forged a close relationship with the Vatican, thanks in part to his relationship with Monsignor Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII. In 1936, Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli visited the United States with his trusted advisor Enrico Galeazzi. Their trip included a visit to the Knights of Columbus headquarters in New Haven, Connecticut. Three years later, Pacelli was elected Pope Pius XII. He chose Galeazzi to be his governor of Vatican City. Certainly for Galeazzi and the nephew of the Pope, the opportunity to meet with him on a daily basis gave them the ability to influence the Pope and also to learn about new initiatives that were ongoing. Those of us of a certain age used to call them the third branch of the Secretariat of State. With the beginning of the Second World War, communication between the Pope and the U.S. government became increasingly important. Galeazzi's vast contacts, thanks in part to his close relationship with the Knights of Columbus, would prove invaluable. It was strategically important that we have some ex parte communication with the Vatican. The Knights of Columbus uh, once again gave a, you know, a good, credible uh, cover for that to go on. In fact, this contact allowed a relationship that did not exist at that moment. It couldn't exist due to diplomatic and political reasons. Therefore, we have to call this relationship providential in helping from the beginning both Rome and also the Vatican. Because the lack of communication, this relationship was helpful for both Rome and the Vatican. At no point did this new partnership prove more useful than in the summer of 1943, as British and American troops invaded Italy from the south. A bombing campaign targeted Rome's military supply centers. On July 19th, there were 112 bombers that dropped 956 bombs. Around 1,500 people were killed, so it was an event that deeply wounded the city of Rome and the Romans. The Pope decided immediately to leave the Vatican, something which did not happen frequently at that time, and to go to St. Lawrence Quarter. At St. Lawrence, there are some very beautiful images of the Pope as the pastor Angelicus, invoking God's assistance for those who were suffering. It was clearly a very important and very touching moment. He was the Bishop of Rome, reaching out to his people who were suffering. I saw the car of the Pope arrive, the Pope got out of his car, and all the people gathered around him. 
He presented himself, first of all, to comfort the people, to pray with them, bless them, but also to assist them with material needs. He arrived there with money that was provided to the victims. The Pope returned to the Vatican with his white tunic covered in blood. There is a letter that Pope Pius sent to President Roosevelt during the years of the war looking to forge an armistice with the Americans. This letter was bought by my grandfather under aerial bombardment, facing many difficulties for precisely President Roosevelt through Cardinal Spellman. The letter never got to Roosevelt, but he got the message. The Allies never bombed Rome again. Pius XII's appeals helped spare Rome from further bombing, but the city still faced widespread poverty and food shortages. St. Peter's Oratory, one of the Knights of Columbus playgrounds, became headquarters of the Vatican's food distribution program, feeding upwards of 400,000 people daily. The Knights became really well known after the war for helping children of the slums especially with the soccer fields, because soccer was by far the most popular sport, and it was really the best vehicle for reaching the youth. The memories that stay with me and that come to mind are beautiful ones, that have deep meaning and significance to my career as a soccer player and as a man. The beautiful thing is that I used to play at the parish, and my father did not know of anything beyond the tryout that I had, and so he did not know if this would be a good environment. But when he learned of the Knights of Columbus, that it was a Catholic organization that helped young people, those with special needs. My father knew that he had sent me to a safe place, and so my life basically began there. So many young people who went on to successful careers credit the Knights of Columbus with important life lessons. In 1944, I went to the Knights of Columbus, and it was a salvation, not just for that summer. It was a place that became a reference point for games, for meeting people, for forging friendships. I used to invite all my friends, lawyers, town councillors, members of parliament, and also a doorman. You understand, the Knights were transcending class divisions. In the years following the Second World War, the Knights commit themselves to the preservation of the very heart of the Eternal City. St. Peter's represents a profound center for the city of Rome, and the enormous line of pilgrims that always exists gives testimony to this truth. In the 1940s, the Knights joined forces with the Vatican and Hollywood filmmaker Samuel Bronston, filming the excavations of the Vatican necropolis, or Scavi. It was our great privilege during the work of the Scavi to be in part responsible for the historical record that was made during that time. With the explosion in global communications in the second half of the 20th century, the Knights of Columbus helped the Vatican utilize these new means of communication. In 1975, the Knights agreed to fund the satellite transmission of major Vatican events. We've done that for the Christmas Midnight Mass, the Easter Week services, the funerals of the popes, we've done that, and we've done the, uh, the, the installation masses the Holy Father have been brought. For many countries, that signal would not have reached them without the help of the Knights of Columbus. 
The Knights of Columbus expanded their support of satellite transmissions during the pontificate of Pope John Paul II. In 1985, the Knights assisted the Vatican in the purchase of a mobile TV production van. Pope John Paul II's partnership with the Knights also extended to his lifelong battle against communism. Ronald Reagan and John Paul II had a great community of interest. Remember, they were practically the only people in the world who believed that the Soviet Union not only should fall apart, but that it would. We hope and we pray today for a time when the people of Poland and all of the peoples on earth will join the people of America in celebrating the joys of freedom and speak together in pride and dignity of the wheat that grows on stones. God bless you and thank you very much. At our 100th anniversary convention in Hartford, uh, President Reagan came and addressed our delegates. Also, the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Casaroli, was there, and the President and the Cardinal had a private meeting in which groundwork was laid to move forward with this diplomatic relationship between the United States and the Holy See. It's not just about diplomacy. This is about human rights. This is about civil rights. This is about so everybody wins. You know, the White House wins, the Vatican wins. I think the Knights have been very useful to U.S.-Vatican relations because everywhere they turn up, it's a positive event, and it's, it's a reflection of the generosity of the American people through the Knights of Columbus. The message of our popes has always consistently been a message of hope, brotherhood, respect for diversity, helping the poor, uh, looking out for human rights. And so that's a message every Catholic needs, but everyone in the world needs that message. From 1980 on, the KFC began collaborating in a unique way with St. Peter's in financing the restoration of works in need of repair. So we sponsored projects that were truly epic. For example, the restoration of the facade of St. Peter's in 1985. You could say the first restoration gave the touch of youth to the facade, and it was greeted with great admiration by all. When we look at St. Peter's Basilica, we see, of course, the most magnificent building ever created by mankind. We see one of the great works of art, the great patrimony of humanity. But when the Catholic faithful looks at St. Peter's Basilica, we see something more. We see this great edifice, which is a testimony to the early regard that the church had for the Prince of the Apostles, St. Peter. The first persecutor of the church no longer exists. The tomb of a poor fisherman mowed down by this ferocious emperor became instead a magnet, drawing together the entire world. The persecutor is finished. The martyr lives on. Over the years, the Knights have continued funding important restorations, including the statues of Saints Peter and Paul on the steps of St. Peter's and the Moderno Atrium leading into the Basilica. This restoring the temple gives to the whole world this message of rejuvenation, that the entire world must continually return to God with an always growing need and enthusiasm, thus always with a younger face. In Rome, the Knights continue to serve the Universal Church 
in the spirit of its founder. 90 years have passed since the Knights of Columbus first met with Pope Benedict XV. From Benedict to Benedict, they continue to stand with the Holy Father. And through the years, the Vatican has learned to really trust the Knights of Columbus. I believe the secret of our success is vested right in that word, trust. It said that there is no sermon more powerful than a strong man on his knees. And I think the fact that you have millions of strong men on their knees with their families is a marvelous witness in the world today. We go where the church wants us to go. So in my opinion, the future will be that which the church asks us to do. We will always be right by their side. The church can always count on the Knights of Columbus. I think the Knights of Columbus has been a great gift to the city of Rome. I'm convinced that Rome's Catholic identity is extremely important. And this is what you do every day, expressing the values of the Catholic Church and Christianity. But I also believe that your experience can serve our city in giving us different points of view and allowing us to become more international. Well, Knights of Columbus are very proud of our long relationship with the city of Rome and the opportunity that we have had to assist in works of charity and building relationships with each new generation of Italians by providing for youth athletics on our field. We also are very proud of the fact that that relationship has gone forward uninterrupted, regardless of an economic situation, a political situation, even in times of war. We have been able to say that what unites us as global citizens is more important than what may divide us politically or economically. And that is a lesson and a message that we need increasingly as we move forward in a greater uh, process of globalization. In honor of